Hi and welcome to Polly Originals with Fiona Abel Smith. Today I thought we'd make this sweet little cherry blossom brooch um, and we've just made it with polymer clay and then filled it with resin and then we've just got the brooch fasting on the back. It's a nice simple tutorial this one. We're going to make the petal canes, make a leaf cane, do the background and then make the whole thing into a brooch and then I'll just show you how to put the resin in at the end. This one's nice and straightforward suitable for all levels of polymer clay artists and I'll take you through what we need to complete the project. So the tools we need to do for today's project, it's not too many, it's not nothing sort of out of the ordinary from what most of you will have to hand. Um, pasta machine, wet wipes obviously standard, tissue blade, cutting our slices. Craft knife always comes in handy. Blunt end in knitting needle, so one of the tools I use a lot. Cocktail stick. A clay roller, don't use it very much but it's usually always handy to have one on hand. If you're doing a brooch then a brooch back to put in your piece. We're going to do smoothing at some stage, so a piece of greaseproof paper and some form of smoothing tool would be handy. It doesn't have to be this, to be honest, you can just do it with your fingers or with the roller if you need to. But if you've got one of these, then that's quite good. We'll need to use a little bit of black acrylic paint. Any watercolour or um, acrylic paint will do, so if you've got some of that to hand. If you haven't got that, then tiny, tiny little bits of um, black polymer clay would do instead. A little bit of texture sheet. This one I'm using is actually underlay, carpet underlay to stop your um, carpet slipping and this comes from Ikea. Measuring sheet. This is the one that I always use. It's done in a one inch and I've just laminated to make it easier to work on and that's freely downloadable from www.printablepaper.net. Then other things to have, um, we need some liquid clay so I'm going to be using the Fimo and I've just decanted it into a little jar here because I find it easier to do. So some liquid polymer clay. We'll need a tile to bake our piece on and some crunched up foil to rest it on. And then we are going to use resin for this one. So in order to use the resin I'm going to use the two part epoxy resin. So you need a measuring cup, something to stir it with a straw for the air bubbles and then whichever brand you want to use this is one I'm using today um, I used the ice resin in the past whichever brand you happen to have but the two-part epoxy resin you'll also need a nice long ruler um, for some measuring we're going to doing it doesn't have to be a ruler we're not measuring so much as just needing a very straight side this is a metal ruler and that's it so that's the tools and now we'll go on to the clay we need So here's the clay we need to do our project today. We've got various elements of the project and I've set out all the clays we um, are going to be using here. I'm working in Fimo Soft, so these are the colours I've chosen in Fimo Soft, but all makes of clay work well for this technique and just substitute for whichever colours you want to use. These blocks here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, are all quarter ounce um, blocks of clay. So that's one eighth of the small packs um, of clay. And in grams, that's about seven grams. These small amounts here and here are half of that. And these small amounts here are half again. So these little ones are about one sixteenth of an ounce or about two grams of polymer clay. And these two are actually even smaller again. So I'll just take you through the colours and what we plan to use them for. These four are going to be to make up the Skinner blend. That's the back of the piece. And I've gone for specific blue peppermint, lilac and white. These colours are going to be making our leaf cane and I've got apple green, white and I've made myself a deep sage green here because in the leaves we have around here on our cherry trees in spring when they've got that nice pink blossom there's quite a deep sagey almost ready turn to leaves and I've made that by using two parts green to one part of the blue and this is Indian red so that's one part of each of those two parts of that and then to do the um, the veins to the leaves and any outside. I've just made myself up a brown. I could have used the chocolate brown from Fimo but I decided since I've got these colours open I might as well mix up myself a colour. So I've got two parts red to one part green and one part blue. So that's the leaf cane. 
The blossom cane is going to be white with a bit of lilac and a bit of raspberry. And then for the burgundy middle, there isn't really a burgundy in Fimo Soft, so I've made myself one equal parts of the Indian red and the plum. So those are the colours for all the elements. The background of the piece and the edging I'm going to choose to do in black, but again any colour you want to do is fine. And then finally I've just got a piece of scrap clay that I've made um, much bigger than the size of what I'm planning to do. And that's gone through setting number three, which is a medium setting on my pasta machine. So that all done, we'll start making the canes. We'll start with the petal cane and then the leaf cane before we do the background, because that will give these a chance to settle whilst we then do the background colours. So we'll start with the first cane. So here are our clays, ready for making into the petal cane, and I've just conditioned them all and rolled the white up into a stub-ended sausage. And what I need to do is make this into a triangular shape, so I'm going to do that just by pinching down on the top with my thumb and finger whilst pressing down onto the bottom, so it creates a triangle. And now we want to wrap this in the lilac, and we want to make sure it goes most of the way over that bit. So I'm just going to pull that slightly longer. I put this through on setting um, number five on my pasta machine, which is a, a thin medium setting. So I've just made it the right length. I'll chop that bit off there to give me a nice flat side. And I'm going to take it all the way over if I can, not quite to the bottom, so that it's nearly reaching from one corner to the other, but the bottom is completely clear. And now we're going to start reducing this, and by reducing this I mean we're going to pull it longer whilst pushing it in the thing thinner. So we simply do that by pulling and pushing it in whilst at the same time rotating. And once it's got about that length, I will push the ends in to make sure they're neat and still covered by the lilac. Chop the whole thing in half and put the two pieces together. And then we're going to repeat and do that four times. doesn't matter if you're not neat with this because this is a petal cane and petals and natural things are not neat so it doesn't have to be even. In fact sometimes I will skew things, actually push them not quite even just so I get a better spread of the coloration so if you want to do that feel free. Okay so we started to get a nice spread of that lilac up through the cane and what we're going to do now we're going to put this back down just press it into a, a short triangle and then we're going to take our raspberry and we're going to add this as a colour on the top. So just make it again the right width. I would recommend doing it about the, the width of the bottom of your triangle. And then just as we did before with the lilac, put this over the point of the cane. And now we're going to do exactly the same again. Reduce this down chop it in half, put the two sides together, and again about four times. Whatever starts to look good on yours. Okay, so we've got there quite a nice mix of the lilac going out towards the top, so it's given us that, that nice um, colour that you get on cherry blossom in spring. And then obviously the darker bits with the raspberry just show through to give some little um, definition to the petals. So all we need to do now is to change that diamond shape into a petal shape. And we do that by pressing in gently down the corners, create more of a petal shape. And then you can use your thumb and finger just to press in and then press in down the edge and all we're trying to do is change that diamond shape to make it more of a petal shape and cherry blossom petals are quite rounded at the top so we will also need to round that but I need to make it much smaller than that because obviously what we're doing needs smaller petals so I'm going to do that by reducing in this sort of roughly um, squared off diamond shape by pressing in with my thumb and finger so I'm not pulling out I'm pressing in um, so I'm going to press in 
all the way down that cane. When you get to the other end, turn it around, so make sure you're pressing in in the right place. And you'll get all your finger marks in it, that's fine, because now you've got four planes. So you've made it effectively into a, a square cane, so you can start to even out those finger marks and then just do the same again. I would have to say this isn't as easy if you have particularly long nails. So if you do have nails, you might want to just reduce this as a square cane um, and do it flat on the board or with a roller. So when you've got it roughly to the size you want, I'm just going to even off or um, round off the edges of my cane. So you see there where the, um, the edges of the point was. I've made them slightly rounder. And then of course we've got quite a sharp point at the end, which is what we don't want with um, a cherry blossom. So this sharp point, I'm going to press it flat and then round it on my tile. So what I'm doing is I'm pressing it in, but then rocking it at the same time. So that should hopefully give us a much better rounded off cane with which to do our cherry blossom. So let's just chop through just out of interest to see what we've got. And there we have our little cherry blossoms. So I'm going to put those on one side as I mentioned earlier um, and we'll leave those to rest and now we'll go and we'll do the leaf cane. So my, for my leaf cane, I've put all the colours through the past machines that are all nicely conditioned. So there's that sagey green that I'd made up, the apple green and the white, and I'm going to do a Skinner blend with these. And to do the Skinner blend, I'm going to cut diagonally down these two, but off-centre them. So I haven't gone quite to the, point, the corners here and here. And then if you pick this one up and put him around that way, pick this one up and put him around that way, they would effectively join together. But I'm going to put um, a double layer of the white in the middle. So it'll be a nicer transition between those two colours. So the white goes in there. And if, like me, you haven't quite got enough to go, that's fine, you just patch. This is polymer clay after all, where you can do that. And I'm going to do the same here. It's going to take a bit off and patch a bit in. So now we've got a nice blend, which will be going from the green so it gets lighter green and then that sage green starts coming in all the way to the end. And I'm going to fold these. These were all done on setting number three, but I've got double the amounts of each of these now. So I'm going to fold them up and put them back through the pasta machine, um, fold end first on setting number two until I get a nice blend. And I'm working on the basis that most of you know how to do Skinner blends. And if you don't, I will put the link to my tutorial on Skinner blends at the bottom of this video. And I'll bring you back when the blend is done. So there we go, there's our Skinner blend with the, um, from the apple green all the way through to the sage green. And just putting the white in the middle there just gives me a nicer um, variation of the colours as they go from one to the other. So I'm going to put this in half, put the two pieces together at one end and press them together. Press it to a point at one end because I'm going to put it back through the pasta machine this way in on the same setting as I was just using, so that's setting number two. So there we go, and now I'm going to put this through on a very thin setting on my pasta machine. Now for those of you whose machines, um, you know that it's quite clunky going down from one setting to another. Do it one setting at a time, so go from two to three to four to five, or the other way around, depending on which way your machine is numbered. Two, by the way, on my machine is uh, my second thickest setting. Although if, if you've got a machine like mine, I know that I can put it straight down through to the thinnest setting, so I will go and do that and bring you back when I've got a nice long thin piece. So here we are with my nice long thin piece and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to concertina it from the light end up to the dark end. So I'll just lay it out flat and of course because it's polymer clay it's just going to stick to itself. I'm doing it probably about an inch or two and a half centimetres thickness as I go. And if you are doing this at home by yourself take a bit longer doing it um, and you can be neater if you like. I'm not worried. I'm going to... Uh, Squidge it in a minute and all the air bubbles will come out. By air bubbles I mean any that have got caught in those folds along the sides. So I will now squidge it and I do it from the middle going upwards. So as I say, any air that I've got trapped will be forced out. And what I'm looking for is a squat round shape about an inch in height. 
So I would press it down, shorter, give it a roll, press it down. And again, because it's a natural thing we're doing, a leaf, I'm not worried that this is not going to be exactly the same all the way down the length. There we go. So that's our little plug for our leaf cane. How I do leaf canes when I'm doing simple ones. There are loads of um, good tutorials on how to do leaf canes out there. This is the way I've always done them. Um, and it's not the simplest way, but it's the way I think gives a nice effect. So I will take my craft knife and the um, stalk of the leaf is towards me at this stage, so away from you. So I'll be cutting one line down and then I'll do three to one side and three to the other side. And the reason I do that and mark that is because in a second I'm going to cut these into two and that way I'll always know which way is up and which side is where and how I need to do, to do my cuts. Now here is the um, dark clay that we made earlier, that I conditioned earlier. So I'm going to put this through on a thin setting on my pasta machine. So for me that'll probably be setting number seven or I might even go eight because this is quite a small leaf I've got here. And what I want it to do is to be about the same height roughly as my leaf. So I'm going to, with my fingers, just press it out so it's already the same height as my leaf. Then put it through the pasta machine that way. I will then get a nice long th thin strip which I know is already the right height um, for me to work to. So there we go, there's our strip. I actually did mine on setting number seven in the end. Um, and I'm going to take my tissue blade and using that as a measure, just cut this so it is the right height for what I want. And now I've got a piece I can start working with. Let's just chop that off there. I can go back to where I'd got all my lines. And with my tissue blade, I'm going to cut straight down through the middle line. Put one half to one side. I'm never worried about the fact I've still got air in there because I'm about to do loads of other things um, to this cane. If this was a cane which was finished, then that could be a problem. But because we're doing other things to it, it isn't. So I now have my lines which I'd scored earlier with my craft life so I know all I have to do is chop down the middle and I take a bit of brown and I add it not quite up to the end turn that over chop off and put the two bits back together and I'm going to repeat that going up this side and then doing the other side so I might well speed the video up slightly just to show you what I'm doing rather than have you watching it all in slow motion. So don't forget, you can always use the three dots at the top of the screen if you want to slow it down so you can see exactly what happens. Okay, so those are the sides done. I haven't bothered being neat and take off the um, brown sticking out the ends because we're about to reduce this. If that bothers you, then obviously when you're doing it at home, take your ends off. And then all I need to do is put the bit down the middle and again, don't go quite to the end. Put your two pieces together and then you can chop off the end piece. And that is how I insert my veins. And I'm going to do exactly the same as we did with the petal cane now. We're going to reduce this down and I'm going to reduce it, keeping that middle vein horizontally across my fingers and just pressing in again, top and bottom, to give me a head start. And this will help get rid of any of the um, air that was trapped in there. Once I've got it to this stage, I effectively have four flat planes to work on. So this is when I can turn it on its side. And I'm doing this in parts, so as I mentioned before, if any of you have got long fingernails, then it can be difficult to do that other motion. So this is the motion I would then suggest you do um, with the petal cane. Using your fingers, just make it into a square cane. And just keep going down till you get to the size you want to. We've actually got quite a lot here. I'm only going to need at least half it if, if that so you can cut through you can start to see how your um, leaves is going to look so I'm going to put one half to one side and just keep on working on one side and cherry blossom leaves are quite um, 
they're quite thin and they have a pointed end. They also have serration all the way around the end, but I'm going to ignore that. Keep going all the way through. And I'm going to bear in mind the size of my petal cane because these petals, they're going to be five of these pushed together, but the leaf wants to be smaller than that, really. So even if I make this thinner, I know I need to go a bit smaller. So again, I will probably chop off a little bit and only work on one bit at a time. It's always nice to keep your extra bits um, larger because you can always use them for other projects then and then make them smaller as you need them. I'm just going to keep pressing down. Keep making it thinner. And then when I think I've got to a stage where it probably is roughly the right height, putting it towards me so I can see which other sides, I'm then just going to press down all the way along the sides of the cane, making those quite long and thin in the way of leaves, but keeping this time the point on the top, because as I said, our leaves for our cherry blossom are quite pointed on the top, and I'm just pressing down where the um, stalk comes out at the end of leaves just to redefine the shape and we'll chop through that one and see what we've got. So there we go, there are our leaves for our cherry blossom to go along with the petals. So those are the canes done. So the next thing we need to do is turn our attention to the Skinner blend for the background. So here are four colours that I'm planning on using for this Skinner Blend. Again, you can swap these out for whatever colours you want to use. I've got the specific blue and the lilac, which is going to be either end of my Skinner, and then I'm going to use the um, peppermint and the white in the middle. So exactly the same as we did with the leaf cane. Obviously, the previous ones I made sure they were lovely and rectangular because that was the first one we did. This one I'm going to show you, it really doesn't matter. So as long as you've got that diagonal cut down through again, the fact that these aren't even on either side really is not going to make any difference when we put the whole thing together. So we're going to put a nice bit of peppermint down there. Drop the white into, and of course again, because I've got two layers now of the lilac, two layers of the blue, I also need two layers of the white and the peppermint. I'm going to chop the excess off here. And exactly the same as we did before, we're going to fold bottom to top and then keep putting it through with the bottom um, fold, with the fold towards the bottom, and we should end up with a nice blend all the way through from the lilac to the blue. And these again were on setting number three when I conditioned them, so I will now put them all through on setting number two on the pasta machine, and I will bring you back when that one is done. So here's my Skinner blend finished, the blue through to the peppermint and then through to the lilac. But I don't, it's on setting number two at the moment and I don't need that much of a thickness. I also am not going to need all of this. So here's my piece of scrap clay that I was going to use for my design. And I certainly don't need more than about half of that thickness. So I'm going to take off the half I want to use. And this bit can be put aside for use in another project. And then I'm going to put this back through the pasta machine on setting number five that way down to make it longer this way. So there we go, so now it's certainly long enough to fit my sheet of scrap clay and what I need to do now is to take off some slices. So using a measuring sheet I'm going to cut myself half inch slices. Of course, you don't need to be this neat. You can make wavy lines, you can make, put them together however you want to do. It doesn't really matter. But we're then going to take our, our sheet of clay. And the reason we've done this is in slices, because whilst this is nice as a background, um, blue sky and then going down into the cherry blossom leaves below it, it's actually nicer still if we do a bit of movement in this. So it's either going one way or the other. Let's, I'm going to put that one that way. I just vary these slices, just move them up. So it just gives, adds something more to the background. So 
So just arrange them however you want. Across the width, I think I'll leave it there because I don't need to be um, any larger than that. And what we need to do now, of course, is to make sure that they're all merged in together. So the easiest way to do this is to get some of the, the wax greaseproof paper and some form of burnishing tool. So there's some greaseproof paper and there's one of these burnishing tools. You can just use your fingers, um, but again it's just easier to use one of these. And what I'm going to do is circular motions, just pressing down and making sure it's all joined together. There's no air bubbles trapped under any of the clay. And I've got a nice mix on all those seams. So that is our piece ready to go. You may not notice because of the way I've put all the leaves and the petals on, but to give myself a bit of a, a heads up as to how I was going to do the design, I do actually put a branch or two on to start with. And I do this very, very simply by just taking some um, little off cuts of the brown clay we had when we were doing the leaf veins and just rolling it into very long, thin pieces. You're not really going to see this much at all. It's just to give you an idea of where to put your leaf placements. And I'm just going to turn this round right way up as far as I'm concerned so I can see what I'm going to do so I'm going to have it sort of coming from this side and the thing to do is to make it don't make it straight so that could be one don't do more say so you, you can do lots if you want to but um, because we're not really going to have many of these showing I probably wouldn't do more than about three just to give me a rough say idea of where to place some leaves up there and let's have one coming down here okay so as if I've got a larger branch coming out and I will just literally press these slightly down in but of course we don't need to press very much for any of this because this is going to be a three-dimensional piece when we're finished so I've just put them enough so that they're adhering to the clay so the thing to do next is to start putting some leaves on so we've got our leaf cane here that we made earlier and depending on how you've done yours, if you notice mine's actually got a flat side here. So because I've got that flat side that's going to give me a bit of a help when it comes to taking slices. So I'm just going to move that up that way a bit. I'm going to place this down on my measuring sheet so the flat side is flat on the sheet. But although that's flat see there's actually a gap down here if I press down flat as I'm chopping that's going to flatten this down so it goes flat on the bottom but if I go across like this going from this side through to this side that will minimize the amount of flattening we get to this side again it does help if your blade is very very sharp mine isn't but we'll go with that anyway and with most things when you're doing polymer clay and taking slices practice makes perfect if you're not very practiced at taking slices don't try to go too thin um, just do something that's comfortable for you as, as I mentioned before this is a three-dimensional piece we're going to backfill all of this with resin so it really doesn't matter how chunky these leaves are so just do something that makes you feel comfortable so as I was going to say we're just going to slice off some leaves here After a while you will find that no matter how much you um, skew your blade, it does actually go a slightly flatter on the bottom. So every so often, just go back and reshape your piece. Right, let's see how we're going with these. The other thing of course about clay is having taken your slices off, you can completely reshape them however you like. 
So let's have a bit of fun and start press pressing our leaves down. This is the point at which I have a slight confession to make. Now, those of you who've been watching my videos probably know by now, I love polymer clay and I love working with polymer clay. And one of the things I like doing more than anything else is adding tiny little bits of polymer clay, light leaves, onto other bits of polymer clay. And what I've just realised is that I like doing this so much that I get carried away when I'm doing it, to the extent that even when I'm filming a video, I forget to check what I'm doing. So when I went to edit this video, particularly the bits where I was adding all the leaves, I suddenly realised I was so in the zone of doing what I was doing that I forgot that I'd moved this completely out of camera shot. So I will take you back in a second to the point at which, for some reason, I put it back into camera shot. But in the meantime, I'm going to just do another quick little video for you just to show you how I add the leaves in. So we left at the point whereby we'd taken our individual slices of leaf, leaf and we'd been able to manipulate and curve them. And then I'll show you what should have been on the original video. Obviously this is not the piece I'm working on because that's now finished and is a completed brooch. So when I'm putting my leaves on, I will see go to the outer point of where my branch is and then be extended beyond it. And then I will start to curve the leaves in always obviously with the um, bit where the stalk would be going down towards the branch changing the shape as I go and sort of putting them so that they touch each other and overlap each other in the way that leaves would do if you're looking down on a proper tree and this is why as I said you don't often see much of the branch left in the finished piece. Then where it's slightly black, I will again just go into midair, as if there was a pretend branch underneath. Add another bit. Add a piece. And just keep working my way back. Just changing the shape and adding leaves on. And then where I've done that on that piece, I will do where I've extended here, I would do exactly the same by extending beyond where the piece was and going back. Same again, curling the leaf, changing it, going back and then finally starting this piece. And just do the same and just building it up until we've got all the leaves put on together. So hopefully that gives you enough of an idea as to how I do the technique and will get me over the hump where I was so in the zone I forgot to remember the fact that I was actually trying to video this. So let's go back to where we got to on the original brooch. more on but I know that I'm going to probably be focusing just on this amount so any I put around the outside I will simply be cutting away so I think I'm happy with that for now. So those are the leaves done. Now for the fun part let's start putting some petals on. Cherry blossoms have generally five petals so I'm going to cut lots of multiples of fives and we'll go from there and see how we do. before just put them anywhere that looks nice and I will normally start with having one where it's completely open she was only a little half petal so I'll just chop and oh there it was I thought I'd done five Don't worry about these little half ones if you get any of these because these are actually quite handy um, to use as well. So again, I'm going to continue um, adding these. The next one I do, I'm going to do slightly differently. So I'll show you that before I start fast forwarding. So it's quite nice to have them. So you've got the three back leaves as if the plant was facing away from you. So it makes it more and more three dimensional. 
and then with the front leaves if it was here and sort of going away from you you wouldn't see all of the fronts so if you chop off the bottom third of your piece and put them like that and push the bottoms flat. It then looks as though the blossom's facing away from you. So that's something else to experiment with as well. Try the different placing of your pieces and make each one slightly different and see how they look in different, um, with blossoms facing in different areas and directions. So I'm actually going to turn this around so it's facing me now so I can have more control over how I'm putting the design together. Um, but say, and then I'll turn it back when I'm done so I'll show you the finished piece. You can also fold the petals over um, to give more shape to them as well. And the other thing is, don't keep the necessary spread out. It, in nature, same as with the leaves, I've got a lot of the leaves where they're overlapping each other. It looks more natural if the um, petals are overlapping each other. They tend to um, cluster together in groups rather than being single. And one final thing, it's sometimes nice to have little, almost half open buds. So just put, rather than doing five petals, I'll fold over a couple so it looks like a half opened bud. So I'm just folding petals in half at the top and then just pressing them down there. So I think probably one more and we will be done. So there we are for the blossoms. There's a few places where I might want to add an extra leaf, so I'm just going to cut myself a couple of extra leaves um, and have them covering over certain places, make sure I've got no gaps. For instance, here. And I thought it might look nice if we'd got a leaf coming up and over these buds, so sort of hide, hide the bottom of them ever so slightly. And that's the great thing, because we're going to put, cover the top of this with resin, we can add all sorts of extra layers on. So the last thing to do is to add the centre to your flowers with the dark burgundy that we made earlier. And we're just going to take tiny, tiny little bits of um, burgundy for this. So I've just taken, say, a minuscule amount. And I will roll it on my measuring sheet and then take off tiny pieces. We've only got really two where you would see the centre of the flowers. And have, have a look, see, there might be a tiny bit just poking through on this one. So you can put him in, but press him down out of the way. So he is, in fact, you can, you can lift up petals, press him down underneath so that you can see him once the press falls a bit back, but it does look as though it's the inside. And I'll probably just do the same with this one. Just lift the petal up, take a tiny wee piece. Push him inside. And 
push the petals back down. So he's there, but he's hidden away. So the only thing to do now is to um, cut out the piece we want for our shape. So let's think. So obviously I'm going to turn this back round to me now so I can see what I'm doing. Um, and what I do is I just use the curve of the blend and I am brave and I just go for it. If you want to, you can mark it out first um, with some form of tool, a cocktail stick and marker or something, but I'm just going to go for it. Okay, that's the top bit. Keep that bit down there. And pull him down there. Then let us... I like doing slightly asymmetrical shapes, so I'm going to use the line of the leaf there and go there. Think so for the brooch. This is where I sort of think, okay, if I've got a brooch, because that's probably what I'm going to do with this, so it's coming this way, how will it look nice like that or like that? So I, I think probably like this. So again, I'm just going to chop down there. So there we go, that's going to be my brooch. So here's my finished piece on to the top of the tile and I spent a little bit of time when I got it here making sure that any finger um, points I'd got um, I rolled out and made them all neat and had a very good look round to make sure there's nothing there that was going to cause a problem once it had been baked. And then because it's nicely flat on the um, baking tile and I made sure I have pressed it down nice and tight, this is the easiest time I find to put that surround in. I have looked at the width of my piece and what I did was I held my tissue blade underneath it and then roughly worked out where the tallest bit was and then put it down on the measuring sheet. So for me, I've worked out that it's one and a half of these squares should give me a nice width because you want your black to go all the way around and be the same height as your tallest width of your piece because that's what's going to hold the resin in place. So I put my black through on a thin setting on my pasta machine. So medium thin, so setting number five on mine. Place it on your measuring sheet and you want a nice long piece. You can patch this if you want to, but it's easier if you're doing it all just with one long piece. And then take a ruler, hold it in place and with your tissue blade, just chop along the end, pull away the excess. And then going from the other way up, so you're not disturbing that line you've just made. As I said, mine is about just over one of those squares. That's about there, I reckon. But it's like most things, isn't it? If, if you do it wrong, or it's not quite the right height the first time, it's just polymer clay. We will just put it back and redo it. I will then give myself one neat end. And then take the whole stuff off, whole piece off, try not to distort it. Come back to my tile, and I tend to start working in a corner. So just put it down and have a rough look. Now this is my tallest bit, so let's have a look. Actually, that's quite a lot taller. So I'm just sort of looking down the side. So if I show you, which is the best way to show you up there. That is quite tall, so I reckon I can go smaller than that. So I'm going to peel that back off. And this is what I was meaning about the fact that you can do it more than once. So I'm going to put that all back through the pasta machine on that setting number five, and then this time do it one square smaller. So I'll bring you back when I've got that all ready to go. To get a nice long thin bit of the dark colour, I put it together like that in a roll and then put it back through the pasta machine that way down so the folds are at the side so any air is going to come out and that way you'll end up with a really nice long thin strip. Okay here we go so times two. Just taking it off the end so I can actually see with my ruler where I'm going so exactly the same as we did before. First time down Take off the excess this side, then turn it up the other way 
so you're not distorting the bit you've just cut through. Put down, and this time I'm not going to pull the excess off so that this, this also isn't right. I have at least still got that there in place. So let's put that to one side and come back to our brooch. Now, this time with it being smaller, so same again, just letting it fall. I'm just going to use the edge of my finger now just to push it into place so it's nice and flat against the tile. And let's have a look this time. Yeah, that's better. That's better. That should be a good depth. So I'm just going to continue to let it come all the way around. And of course, because it's polymer clay, we don't need any glue or anything. It's just going to fit all the way around. So I'm making sure it is nice and flat against the tile at the bottom. And I've noticed I wasn't quite at the edge of my corner of the brooch there so I'm going to just if I can cut down there there we go and then pull that round so that I should be able to have a really nice cut down and have a neat join and you do need to make sure it is joined because of course again you don't want the resin to fall out and then lastly I'll just use the blunt end of my blade apologies for the noise pushing all the way down and making sure it's retaining the shape of your brooch and that is now ready to cook. So here's our piece finished and baked and out of the oven and I've given my, put the rest of the um, black clay through the pasta machine and rolled that out on a medium setting that's number three on my pasta machine. And I've made a piece that's big enough to fit over the back of my brooch. And so I've just put it on there and with a cocktail stick I'm just going to run around the edge. Because I personally find it easier to then pull this piece off. Of course because I've used this on this laminated uh, measuring sheet it's quite easy then to fold up and pull off. So I can now put that to one side. Whilst with my craft knife I can cut round where I made the mark with the cocktail stick. don't have to be completely exact so we will trim this off in a minute but there we go and at this stage I've got it um, facing me I've now got a rough idea of um, the shape of the finished piece and the way it sits and I can take my brooch fastening and decide now which way I want it how I want it facing towards me so whereabouts I'm going to put the brooch and have it level also where this might be a piece that I would want to add um, one of the chains to later um, so that I could have it as both a pendant and a brooch. So just run your knife, craft knife down the edge there. I'm going to peel that off and then I'm just going to take out a little triangular cut there because that end of the brooch piece goes in thinner. And then whilst this is still in place I'm just going to take that out and then cut off triangular piece and cut a piece off that end because you don't need the whole amount to go into the back of your brooch. Turn my brooch over, a little bit of liquid clay, now not a lot of this, just enough to make it sticky, not to make it slidey and I'm being very careful how I hold this as well so I'm not pressing down too hard on the top surface and I just want to get a little bit of this coating all over the back. If you have it too much then your backing piece will slide off, so just enough to make it tacky. And now I should be able to take this off my measuring sheet on the back, turn it over and fit it into place. And the hole's already cut out there for where I want my brooch to be, so I'll just check that that would be right. And if I'm happy with it, I can put my brooch piece in place and again very carefully so not pressing down too much on the back put the piece extra piece in there that I cut out and then with a knitting needle I should be able to just roll this piece 
over so it fits nicely in the gap there. So the brooch back is buried in the back of the piece and gives you a nice professional looking finish. Take your time, roll around the edges, make sure you've got all those gaps and move the pieces of your brooch as well to make sure they're not going to get stuck in the clay. You can either have a completely flat back or you can get something, um, some form of textured sheet and press that in. The other thing I do at this stage is I will just press down on this so I give myself a little groove there, I don't know if you can see that, where this spring sits in. And I find doing that now, whilst the clay is soft, means you put less pressure on this bit um, than having that flat at the back. So I'm just going to get myself some texture sheet. I use this one quite a lot. It, it makes a good um, texture sheet for doing other things as well, because you a really nice pattern if you're doing um, loads of other techniques in polymer clay. But I find if I screw it up, a bit of a ball like that and press it in. It gives me a nice random pattern without leaving all the bits in it that some of the um, the other texturing sheets that people use a lot can do. So I'll just press over this until I've got a nice finish to it. And then when I'm happy it's uh, textured as I want to, then because this bit's already cooked, we should be able to take our tissue blade and just chop off any excess around the side to give us a nice smooth look. And I will often just give a roll around with my knitting needle just to make sure those two layers are nicely combined. And then I will bake that, not closed, um, because it's it'll put too much pressure on your piece and pull away but what I do do because I want to bake it that way up let me just move this out of the way so I, I want to bake it that way up for two reasons one because I want to make sure I don't put any pressure on this thin outer layer and that bends when it's cooking but also because I know that after it's baked I'm also going to have to put it this way up um, because we're going to put the resin in. So what I've done is I've put some foil here and created myself a groove where that brooch pin will sit. And now I know that I can bake that and it will sit nicely, bake nicely and because I've got a textured back it doesn't matter if the foil sticks in in a couple of places in the back it will just add to the texture. So I'll now bake that um, again according to the manufacturer's instructions and then we'll come back for the final bit of decoration on the face of the brooch and get round to putting the resin in. So I'll bring you back when that is finished baking. So here's our piece out of the oven um, and I've, what I've done is I've put it on a piece of foil, closed up the brooch back um, and put it on a piece of foil and I've just got a tiny little bit of um, black acrylic paint here and what I'm now going to do is I'm going to do the little bit of um, the anthers that go around the centre of the cherry blossoms and I've taken a cocktail stick and I've pressed it hard down against a flat surface just to give myself, I don't know if we can get that so it's in focus, um, a little bit of a blunt end and then you just practice on this piece of um, paper you should be able to take a little bit of the clay and just dot down to give you tiny little dots. If you've got a very thin fine paintbrush then obviously use those instead but if not then doing this just using the end of a cocktail stick is another good way of doing it. So you don't want too much paint on so I'm just going to move that into a, a flatter area. So go smooth a bit of out so it hasn't got much in the way of depth. And I've just wiped the end of my cocktail stick and you should now be able to just take that and just create little black dots going around the edge of your flower so just to look like the anthers that come out 
the cherry blossom. Don't forget to do some in the middle as well because they're all around it. So for both the ones where I've got full open blossoms, I will do that the whole way around. Try to make it slightly random as well. They're all not all neat. They're roughly, roughly circular, but say not all neat. And then these ones, where they're only half showing, you'd only do it for the bits around the back. aren't hidden by the petals in front and then these ones probably just a couple you wouldn't really see much in the way of anthers showing when they're that unopened okay so that is then done And we're just going to wait for that to dry and before it does dry the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure this foil this is the same foil as I used um, for cooking it but I've flattened it slightly so I've got the nice groove where that's going to um, sit in the back and I'm going to press this foil down and move it up and around so that my piece is sat completely flat horizontally um, if necessary get a spirit level on it to check because we're going to fill this with resin once that paint has dried and so because of that we want this to be absolutely flat. So I'll just wait for the paint to dry, make sure I have got mine nice and flat and I'll bring you back when I've done that. Okay so the last part of the tutorial all we need to do is to create enough resin mix to fill up the whole of our brooch front there or whatever the pieces you're making. Now I'm going to use the two-part epoxy resin. Um, I'm actually using this one, this make. I've used other ones in the past. Ice resin um, is a good one as well and there's loads of places to get them so just use whatever make you like best. This one is a one-to-one -one ratio. Some of them are different so obviously just work to whichever one you work to. So I've made this as flat as I can get it on my tile, so I'm just going to put that to one side whilst I mix the resin. And here's the measuring cup. Now, although that's quite deep, I know I don't need too much, so I'm going to do a quarter of fluid ounce of both of them and then see how we go. So that's the first part done. And then using my spatula, I'm just going to mix these and make sure I've got a really good mix of the two types. So now I'm going to take my piece and I'm just going to pour the resin in. I'm going to make sure I'm going to have a very clean cocktail stick. So I use the clean end I didn't use for paint earlier. And I'm going to try and make sure that the resin fits all the way under all these little bits and pieces so there's no air bubbles created anywhere. So just take it and start to pour it in.
Um, what you have got, you can probably see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small bubbles that are always created because of all the stirring you do in the resin. And I've seen several tips and techniques on YouTube um, for how to get rid of these. But the, the best one I've found, um, and the one I've used ever since I came across it, is a straw. So just blow gently with the straw on the surface and that will get rid of all of the bubbles. And again, I'll spend a bit of time doing that and bring you back when I'm done. So there we go, there it is with all the resin done and all the blowing done, so all the bubbles are out. So now I'm just going to leave that, say, 24 hours to make it nice um, surface touchable and then I'll leave it probably about 72 hours just to make it completely sure I've cured. But I'll bring you back after 24 hours and show you the finished piece when it's ready to be handleable. So there we are, there's our finished piece. Cherry blossom brooch with resin to give you that really nice three dimensional effect there. Obviously you can use other things to finish this off. Um, you could use the UV resin, you don't even have to put all the resin on, you can just leave it as a three dimensional polymer clay piece. Could be a brooch, can be anything you like, so the brooch back's in place there. But that was it, so I hope you enjoyed that one. I think it's quite a fun one to do and if you did don't forget to tick like and subscribe so you get notified of any new videos I do and thank you as always for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.